start by welcoming everybody to Fool 13. Um, the virtual reality section uh, of teaching is going to be fun. I think this is basically more of a, an open forum for discussion uh, that we're doing today on uh, medical plants. Um, of course, just keeping in mind this is a historical discussion. Um, it's important to realize that there's lots of uh, remedies and things that people have used over ages for historically uh, curing ailments that does not necessarily mean we should try any of these things. Um, and if you do know some things about herbs and stuff, I mean, obviously, we always encourage people to, you know, make sure you check with physicians if you're taking medications, other things can conflict with medications you're taking. So even teas and things that you think are harmless uh, should always be, uh, you know, basically researched and uh, checked with other people to make sure that uh, medically it's safe for you to be doing so. Um, anyways, uh, that being said, um, can I just get a show of hands? How many people have done already some research and have a little bit of knowledge? Just uh, put your hand up of, of people that have basic knowledge or have looked into some plants great um, anybody brand new just curious not sure that they've really checked anything out before show of hands great okay good good um, so uh, obviously just because a product is natural does not mean it's safe um, going back in history there's so much documentation of uh, historical plants i uh, will definitely never be able to touch on everything today um, if there's anything people are really interested about or want to chat there's a at the very bottom of your screen you should see a chat bar uh, you can actually chat to everyone or you can specifically just put a question out to um, the mediator, the moderator. Um, I think you can do that. Just double checking. You can put it out to Bernard uh, and uh, we can feed it through that. Um, so if there's something specific you're looking for, if we can um, type it there, that'd be great. Um, what else can I start with? Oh, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about history of plants, um, just in the sense of, I found it fascinating when I was doing some research about plants and how they've been renamed over the centuries. Uh, so if you look up a lot of plants, uh, you'll find uh, that a lot of them were used uh, with wart on the back. If it was something that was used for um, the root or a plant that was medicinally used, um, I found this really fascinating. So things like you hear in readings when you're looking, you hear lungwort and starwort, motherwort, bishopwort, bloodwort, throatwort, brotherwort, all these warts. And I, I started investigating what does the what, what does this mean? Like what are these plants? Then why did we lose these names? Um, you know, it started basically with um, uh, them understanding or feeling that they we're going to name things um, so that it made sense uh, for them to be able to identify a plant um, for its medicinal use. So if you called something lungwort, they looked at the plants, they saw that it had spots, and it looked like, uh, you know, an infected lung. So they started to use this plant. This plant was used, uh, you know, for things like uh, liver issues, you know. So very interesting how, you know, uh, bloodwort is uh, basically, I believe it's uh, plants from the poppy family, uh, which obviously deals with, you know, blood and people talk about, you know, there's, I don't know, 775 different species of poppy out there. So, I mean, uh, it was really interesting uh, to learn a little bit more about that. So, has anybody got any information about um, those type of plants that uh, have the wort on the back? I'll open it up for anybody to jump in. Okay. Um, I know motherwort and mugwort. Those are two that I personally work with and know something a little bit about. I don't know what to talk about uh, about them though. Okay. Um, so, do you grow any of the herbs, like in your in your own garden? Uh, I live in an apartment, okay. so um, 
gardening is not as particularly easy. Okay. Um, we have very, very bad sunlight. We have, we're limited to afternoon. So um, I'm not very good at gar uh, gardening. I'm more of the, let's go find them out in nature type. Right. Absolutely. No, that's okay. Um, motherwort was the first one that I heard that you mentioned. What was the other one? Sorry. Mugwort. Mugwort. Okay. So motherwort, I have a little bit of information on it. It sounds like um, the name, as it implies, was given to the plant because it was used for female weaknesses or disorders. So it was used to treat hysteria, uh, palpitations, fainting, tremors, um, and it was to quiet the mind. Um, uh, it, it was said that there was no better herb to drive them out the melancholy. So um, vapors from uh, heat uh, to strengthen and make uh, the mind cheerful um, and to, to be merry. So interesting that, you know, again, using the, the name at the beginning, Mother Wart, uh, was to help you to remember what that plant was good for. Um, the other one, what was the other one? Sorry. Mugwort. Also one thing about mugwort, do not take it if you are pregnant or yep. want to be pregnant. Yes, there are quite a lot of plants actually, um, that have, um, you know, um, that promote menstruation. So they also can inadvertently, you know, not be good for anybody who's pregnant. Um, so interesting that they used plants um, that had um, you know sometimes some pretty nasty side effects um, um, just going actually talking about that um, does anybody want to talk a little bit about some of the poisons that they had um, I would like to bring up a motherwort comment I'm Gus oh, yeah. I'm out here I'm sorry That's um, okay. I had a friend in well, I have a friend still and she was very interested in uh, herbs around motherhood and pregnancy. And she talked about how she really craved the taste of something really bitter right after her pregnancy, right after her birth. And the motherwort was the thing that she really wanted and it really helped uh, expel the afterbirth. And so I'm not sure if I can't remember in the literature if that's anywhere, but it's, I could, if that's the case, it's pretty, then it's pretty clear why you wouldn't take that when you're pregnant because of the muscular contractions that would occur. Exactly, exactly. The, that being said though, uh, sometimes uh, things that, um, you know, have like that type of effect, for example, if you were having a difficult birth, um, they could have given you that because they're trying to yeah. help you in your last part of your delivering the afterbirth type thing. So you're right. Uh, you know, sometimes things that, um, you know, sound like they have a horrible kind of side effect yeah. had sometimes purpose. Oh, well, some sure. I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah. She, but she talked about the, the, the taste of it was the thing that she really wanted. So that was an interesting like it's anecdotal, so I don't know if it's with everybody, but that was the, that was what hit the spot for her when she did this and she's had three, three or four kids. So it, it didn't seem to impact her afterwards or anything like that. So I just wanted to bring it up because I can't remember if it's, if I've read it anywhere. Great. There's a few people that are uh, raising hands on the chatter here on the side, sorry, uh, uh, about uh, talking about toxic plants. Uh, Lucia, did you want to start with uh, some, some that you're familiar with or some comments? Oh, there we go. Um, I thought I could press the space bar and talk, but I guess not. Um, uh, Orla also wants to speak, but um, Rue, comes up in recipes all the time, R-U-E, Rue, um, but, and half the population thinks it's delicious, and the other half the population, it's poisonous. So we don't use it in cooking, even though you might have grown up with the plant being, you know, in your house garden, um, because it is poisonous to half or more than 
the, of the population. That's the only thing that comes like right off commonly used herb that's poisonous. Right. Okay. Orla? All right. Um, regarding toxic plants, I think it's the Hamilton's Royal Botanical Gardens has a, an area that is a bunch of the toxic plants garden. Uh, so sometimes people who are tucked away, you can still go and see all of them in person in places like that. I know they have them you know, overseas as well, but I think when I was at the Royal Botanical Gardens, they had a section that was all these toxic plants. I've grown a few, and I know a bunch that show up in Culpeper are really common in our gardens. I mean, lots of people grow foxglove, uh, which is digitalis, and another one that I have grown, uh, and it still exists at my mother's, is monkshood. And they're beautiful garden plants. And every so often, there's a few people a year that die because they are not aware how toxic some of these plants are. Um, monkshood or aconite has six foot tall spires and it flowers in September and October. And it looks a lot like a perfectly harmless plant. The aconite, unfortunately, like the digitalis, they're both uh, cardiac stimulants. So they still have, um, you know, not what we think of, you know, common modern medical uses, but they absolutely do have chemical properties that we formulated cardiac drugs forward from that we use to modern day. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know. I, I, uh, I, I know that foxglove is obviously one that people speak about, has beautiful flowers. Um, it also has, I think Lily of the Valley also has the same um, um, properties to it as foxglove. Uh, one of the things that um, you're right in the cardiac talking about that. Um, so those particular ones, um, they slowed the heart, I believe, uh, is, is, is what uh, that that chemical does. And then, you know, you have things like uh, deadly nightshade is another one, uh, which uh, speeds up the heart. So knowing your poisons can also be an antidote in those times. Uh, knowing that, you know, if you've taken too much of one product, you can use another product that will make you throw up or help you dispel it or help counter the, the problem was important. Um, you know, um, having uh, deadly nightshade was uh, also talked about a little bit in the sense that uh, it used to be used in drops and put into the eyes uh, to make your eyes really big because it was considered a, a beautiful thing to have big pupils. Uh, and, and I think that's where it came, uh, they, they, uh, what do they, they call it belladonna, I believe, uh, the lovely lady, which basically it's like people were actually doing this to themselves, not realizing that you can have hallucinations for like 12 hours after putting drops in your eyes. <laughs> Why would you want to know some of those poisonous plants? Well, it, back in the time, if you're thinking historically, if you had certain drugs uh, that pro provided relief of pain, but also hallucination or, or um, unconsciousness, if you were doing surgery or even dental work, my goodness, with no anesthetics and things that we see today, um, you know, sometimes you would take those plants just to risk, uh, take that risk to eliminate pain in certain circumstances, I'm sure. Um, just looking, it, yes, Lily of the Valley is just looking at some of the comments on the side. Sorry, just want to make sure people are talking about keeping, uh, keeping uh, certain plants away from pets. Obviously, there are some pets that uh, we have to be very careful if you're growing things in your garden that have uh, um, you know, poisonous. Yep. Go ahead, Gus. Um, I was curious. Um, I just wanted to bring up, I don't know why, um, we were talking about poisonous plants and when I was like four or five, I can't remember. The, everyone was talking about buttercups and being four and literal, I ate a whole bunch of them because, well, buttercups. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was pretty bad. <laughs> And it made me think about just sometimes the names of the plants can encode the, like, deadly nightshade. Okay, <laughs> deadly, don't want to eat that, right? If, if we used, rue, if we used a, a modern word for rue instead of, like, what we know is the, the like, rue bad, then you, you stay away from them. But words like buttercup, which is goat's rue, I think, yes. You know, when you're a kid, you don't know those, you don't, you know, realize those things. And 
I, I obviously survived, but I can't remember what happened after I ate them. And then it was, you know, and it was really weird. I just wanted to bring it up because sometimes kids get these things and they hear the wrong word and think they're going to eat stuff and stuff. So, yeah, I, absolutely. so, and I wanted to ask as a complete aside is what are your techniques for teaching herbs to people and or learning them yourself? Like, I'm just curious what people think about that, but we can bring that up after as another topic. I hope I'll mute now. <laughs> We can definitely, we can go back to that. Um, I'd be curious to see if people want to participate, but give them a few minutes maybe to think about that, think about the responses. Um, going back to uh, um, the poisonous things, just talking quickly about uh, things like mandrake or uh, mayapple is another one people talk about. Um, they did use uh, mayapple at one time before surgery and uh, for eating, again, it was an afterbirth, I believe, uh, thing that they use. It's highly toxic. Um, they used it as well though for a topical to get rid of planter warts. So, I mean, that wasn't necessarily a poisonous thing to, in, it's in, ingesting it, that was the poisonous thing, but using it as a topical, it actually helped with getting rid of certain types of like planter warts, which was, I thought, interesting. Um, another one that we hear a lot about uh, is, you know, castor oil being a, a, you know, we heard a lot of very positive things about castor oil for many times, but the castor bean itself, um, you know, you have to be very, very careful about, especially children. Just looking again at the comments, uh, yes, I believe uh, May apples uh, as a kid, yeah, you've got to be careful. It sounds like something you should eat. <laughs> you should not. Um, of course, different. there's so many different types of forms uh, medically uh, for plants that we used. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes we just think of teas and, and ingesting, but they did so much. They, they did salves and plasters and poultices and snuffs, um, and gargled with it. Uh, you know, there was so many different ways of using plants uh, from flowers to roots. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Sometimes we hear that plants are good for things, but uh, you have to kind of dive in a little bit more to find out if it's something you're supposed to mash up the leaves and put it against a wound to help it or whether you were supposed to drink it in tea or or that type of thing yes cashew is another one poisonous unless it's cooked properly that's a good comment as well um, finishing up just a little bit with the poisons, uh, interesting, I read some things about um, um, some of the rulers uh, of the times, um, you know, Cleopatra, uh, Egypt, uh, we're talking, um, did a lot of research on um, poisons and different poisons and how they worked. Um, they didn't just, uh, they used poisons particularly seemed they were fond of prisoners um, who they uh, experimented on um, in order to understand poisoning because they were looking for antidotes. They were also trying to figure out how they could identify poisons and what happened to a person when poison was taken. There's a request uh, to, uh, to know a bit more about hemlock and also where the plants come from. Oh, thank you. Uh, where the plants in general come from? I don't know. Just like Margaret? which cultures use which plants, so we know which uh, uh, which plants are used by whom. Oh, just repeat that once more. I got it cut off at the very beginning. Sorry. Uh, which plants are used by whom? Like which cultures? Okay, that's a good uh, question. Um, my research that I've done, a lot of it was going back to uh, Greek, Egyptian, and early medieval, but it, it's kind of across the board. Uh, um, I'm a little light on the, the research in total. Does anybody else have any more input so far? No? Okay. Um, the other one was hemlock. Uh, uh, sorry, I just, I do have input about hemlock. Hemlock is native uh, uh, from Europe as, um, as far as, um, I believe, uh, North, uh, Northern Africa. But what was, we don't have much detail on what was 
done with it outside of uh, outside of Europe. Okay. Yeah, there's some great comments as well. Uh, just talking about um, uh, you know herbs and different um, um, books and things that are available. Um, Comfrey is also uh, topically uh, safe topically. Uh, but again, it's one that, uh, yeah, you have to be careful from strain to strain. Um, that one, uh, it looks like I have a little bit of notes on, on comfrey. Comfrey was used in 24 different countries. Uh, used for soreness, it heals uh, sickness. It talks about using the leaf as a poultice. Um, uh, they used it a lot for um, bruises and tissues and broken bones. Um, they used to use the leaves uh, like a cast, um, put it around a bone and it would almost create like a plaster um, and it helped with healing. Um, the other name that they used uh, for comfrey was bone set or bone knit bone. Uh, so interesting again, using the word of what it was good for and putting it into the name uh, was something that they did a lot. There's a, a comment to me about daffodil poison, which I'm currently confused. Oh, I'm thinking dandelions, which people eat a lot of. Um, I'm not sure about daffodils being poisonous. I haven't heard that. Um, well, uh, interestingly enough, I don't know a lot about poisoning, uh, but I do know that daffodils uh, were brought over from the Romans uh, into Europe. Um, they believed that daffodils healed wounds. Um, I think they were sadly disappointed when they found out that it just irritated their skin really badly. So uh, I don't have anything on medicinal stuff for, um, <laughs> for daffodils or um, narcissums, but uh, I have heard that they're um, not necessarily a, a, a good one for eating or having anything to do with. I would imagine they probably, a lot of times uh, you get, um, if you're eating something, it, it when we say poisonous, there's different levels, I guess, of poisonous. You can get really, really sick, uh, stomach aches, and and feel, you know, get the runs and different things, which also feels like you've been poisoned. All right, I've got a whole bunch of notes here. Does anybody want want me just to go ahead and read some things out, and you can jump in if you've got anything. I'm going to need uh, maybe help from <laughs> uh, Irony from you. Just if you see anything on the side, please jump in and let me know. Just because as I'm reading, it's hard for me to see the comments on the side. Um, let's start with uh, uh, Star's Wart is when we, we talked about uh, when we were talking about namings with the uh, back end being wart. Um, it's a, a wild form of aster. Um, so if you think of New England asters or the purple asters, um, it, the Greek meaning was star, I guess, for aster. Um, so it was sacred. It was actually used for putting on wreaths and uh, they used to um, believe that uh, if they burned the leaves, uh, that it would ward away snakes. Um, and they also believed that if they crushed uh, the roots uh, of the aster, they could feed it to bees that were in poor health, which I found actually kind of interesting because we're talking about medicinal, but it's not necessarily always human medicinal. Um, so that was kind of a little bit of interesting. Um, chrysanthemums is another one that I've got. We're talking about flowers. Uh, um, Teas are used a lot, uh, thousands and thousands of years, I believe they used uh, the leaves and teas um, in Asia and Europe. Um, they believed it, it helped with headaches and dizziness, sore throat uh, and blurred vision. Um, and it's said to reduce the blood pressure and include, include, um, uh, increase blood flow. Oh, there's lots of comments happening. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think Gus is sharing information that people those can are, uh, read on their own. Are, yeah, those are good informations uh, on the side. Uh, interesting. Um, calendula, uh, this is uh, called uh, potted marigold. Um, so it's not like the marigolds you think of today. It's more of a, a European marigold. Um, it was used a lot for um, 
um, helping with and like an antiseptic uh, in wounds and fungal rashes, insect bites, um, basically used a lot for healing skin. Um, so that's a, an interesting one, as well as one we see in the spring is called columbine. Um, uh, they used to use uh, this and the seeds uh, of columbine to help get rid of lice. Um, it was thought that columbine was eaten by lions. Um, so it was supposed to be if you rubbed your hands on the plant and the flowers, it was supposed to give you the courage of lions, which uh, is interesting how, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, looked at plants and uh, came up with their own personal remedies or thoughts about um, how they're powerful in their own minds. Um, Romans and Greeks um, uh, believed that uh, Columbine was the plant of uh, Aphrodite, Venus. Um, so they really fe felt that it was uh, a plant that um, was close to her. Um, and columbines grow really well in my backyard. And then they spread and they keep growing everywhere. <laughs> yes, and there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting things about columbines in just uh, looking at the different flowers. Uh, some columbines come out almost like a, an alien. They have like five protrusions in the back. Uh, and interesting, when you read up about these type of plants, they talk a lot about how they try to move them into religious like documentation and how you know they were spiritual to different religions and um how they played an important role in 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 identifying them some herbs uh not necessarily flowers but things like dill we've got uh dill was something that they used to aid in digestion um so kind of like grape water that we talk about we use for stomach cramps or or you know, flatulence uh, for small children. Uh, they used to use dill water uh, to soothe babies' colics. Um, uh, and uh, they used it, uh, magicians used it. Um, it. They believed it was a charm against witchcraft. <laughs> um, we've got uh, elderberry. Elderberries, uh, uh, a lot of uh, people know today and think that elderberry has a lot of um, good things to do with immunity and increasing your immunity, um, used for colds and flus. Um, it was a diuretic. Um, they used uh, it to line, to, to, to the flower itself uh, is, was used a lot for allergies, um, to help with asthma uh, and to help um, people with severe allergies, which I found really interesting. I'm not sure about the dill water, uh, uh, is the tea made with the dill? I, I believe so. Um, I'm not 100% sure. It's something we could look up on the side, I'm sure. <laughs> um, elderberry was uh, also called, again, it was elderwort. Uh, it was uh, really uh, believed that in European folk folklore that it was um, a bush or um, something that was grown from the elder mother. Um, so you were never to cut it down. Um, it would be extremely bad luck if you were to cut it down. Um, so that's kind of interesting as well. Uh, fennel. Um, fennel was useful for ing uh, ingestion. Uh, bloating, stomach pain, uh, and the seeds were used uh, and promoted uh, for breastfeeding, uh, for lactation, for mothers. Um, ferns is another one that we see out. I got, <laughs> I was out in my garden. I was saying earlier, uh, um, unfortunately, my neighbor is cutting down wood today, but my ferns are just starting to grow. I'm so excited. Um, I love to eat fiddleheads in the spring. It's one of my personal favorite things to eat. Um, but uh, it's very interesting uh, reading up about plants and what people believed. They believed uh, um, in medieval times, the root of the male fern was important um, in um, making a love potion. So I haven't tried that personally, but it sounded pretty interesting when I read it. For me. <laughs> um, 
of course, there's a lot of different types of ferns. So when they talk about ferns, it was really hard for me to decipher which type of fern they were talking about. Uh, they called it spleenwort uh, and also maiden's hair. Uh, it was used for wounds and inflammations, headaches, um, epilepsy, asthma, menstrual problems, uh, pain in chain, uh, childbirth, and in, in for intestinal worms for, I guess, getting rid of. I have to say with uh, many of the medieval ref, uh, remedies that <clears throat> worked effectively, that still come through to the day, mostly they're things that were very obvious response. Um, wormwood as a dewormer, it works, you know, they probably used it in livestock as well as in people. The, the results are obvious. Um, you know, the emetics, things that make you throw up because of the humoral medicine concept. If you have too much, this will make you throw up. If you need this, maybe bloodletting. And so the ones that had the really obvious, you know, either you threw up or things moved through you very quickly, um, they were really on point on those. <laughs> Everything else seemed to sort of follow a sympathetic sort of thing with, you know, as you say, the lung wart, the spotted leaf looking like a diseased lung. Well, maybe, you know, because, you know, divine wants to drop us a hint maybe something that looks like that thing would be helpful for the problem in a person you know um fingers crossed hopefully we don't kill the patient seems to be a whole lot of uh, medieval medicine um i have a quick question if it's okay yeah absolutely um, so I know that there was lots of sort of like poultice and, and things that they would put. And I guess my question is, um, for with open wounds, putting things into the open wound, like herbs, it seems like a very bad idea. Like was they, did they like layer these herbs like in like fabric and then put them on or like, I guess I just, I don't understand how it worked without, you know, people just getting infected and dying. <sighs> That's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I have the true answer because I think it might have depended on which plants you were using. For example, there's some plants that are really good for clotting blood. So if you were outright bleeding, maybe you wanted to use that plant directly on. Whereas other plants, it talks about how if you make the poultice, you should, or pul the pul pulp, that you should really make sure that the wound is just starting to heal a little bit before you apply. So I'm sure that a lot of those type of things were handed down, you know, kind of from one person to the next, mother to child, so that, uh, you know, uh, or soldiers would hand down information um, on what worked for them and what didn't work for them. Does anybody else have comments on that? That's a really interesting question. And a lot of things have like anti-fungal um, and antibacterial properties to begin with, so that would reduce your risk of infection. Like, I and I don't, and I do think like there were some like barriers, but um, a lot of things you were putting in there would reduce your chance of infection to begin with as well. Great, thank you guys. No, that's a great question. I was uh, looking to see if I could find a few that uh, um, they had like, um, um, kind of comments on the plants to be careful that uh, um, there's certain plants as well that um, not just clot blood, but actually um, uh, if taken, you've got to be careful that you don't bleed out if you get a cut um, because they'll actually um, thin the blood. Um, so, I mean, obviously that could be good for certain things, but could be very detrimental if you were, you know, doing something and got hurt. Also, I know we've talked about hemlock. You want to be careful when burning hemlock because it can cause a diuretic re response, the smoke. So if you like inhale hemlock smoke, it's not great for your bowels. That's a very good point. It's kind of the same with, uh, you know, other poisonous things. I, uh, you know, hear about uh, poison ivy and poison oak. 
uh, my husband had a personal experience of we were burning weeds and we had had many people over to help us pull weeds when we first moved into our house. Um, and it all got a, put into a big burn pile and we didn't realize that some of the plants in there were poison oak and that being burned basically had him break out all over because it's not that he touched it, but he inhaled it. A friend of ours, he, uh, he's allergic to poison ivy and he, he was burning it and uh, his, he had his arms bandaged for weeks. It affected his breathing. It's very, very nasty. Mm -hmm. And it brought, can be brought in by pets, his, in his case, cats. Oh and dear. He has to be careful that the cats aren't uh, haven't been in the weeds. There's a question about the naming of um, hemlock how deadly hemlock and the conifer tree hemlock ended up with the same name. That I don't know. As Anne says, it's important to understand the Latin names of things because they are far more often an accurate representation of what the plant is. Um, so I might have a, a bit of information on the, uh, how, on the connection between the hemlock tree. Um, so, um, there, um, my understanding uh, from courses I've taken on uh, native plants um, is that they were, uh, it was named hemlock. Uh, it got the common name hemlock because the tree looks similar to uh, the hemlock that's in. Um, that's native to Europe and uh, North Africa, but the two plants are not in any way related. Good to know. I guess that's the thing about renaming things. Sometimes, uh, you know, people in different areas uh, would have completely different names for plants. So, you know, going with something like the Latin renaming was done so that we could all have a common name for something and 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 be able to you know identify it clearly from different districts they're talking earlier about sometimes uh you know things that we use um for cooking uh does anybody have any other examples of uh plants that we've used like ferns or things like that that are used in cooking that uh also have uh medicinal backgrounds i know saffron does Well, I mean, there's there's ginger in cooking that is considered a palmative uh, now, you know, good for our stomachs, but it may have been uh, sort of thought of as promoting hot humors in the medieval times. So its uses have certainly changed, but we still use it in cooking. That's true. That's true. There's a lot of, like, all cooking is medicinal in medieval times because that's what was readily accessible. The physic wasn't but foods to promote one humor over another um, were definitely available and they used them quite in that regard. Um, and in, in meal placements as well, like uh, somebody has uh, wrote a comment about to rooted parsley, but I mean, I'm thinking parsley in general was used sometimes in meals to help with the digestion of food and, and clean breath as well, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I know ginger. Like I've, I've used ginger like as a, as a relish and garnish, but I also, when I don't have my migraine medicine around, it's a, it's one of those things that can really help with some of the nausea symptoms when migraines start coming on. So like for me, that's been a, that's been very useful and helpful. And it's funny, it's different. There's a difference between the wild ginseng that grows in, I mean, wild ginger that grows in North America that's hard to find and the the large store-bought ginger root. Like but those are the same strain. They're both ginger but different kinds of ginger like mm -hmm. the same way you'd see different types of mint or spearmint or basil so like uh, glangulil is a uh, blue ginger uh, which is a uh, it's a little milder 
than what we generally see in North American stores, but, and it actually has a blue vein to it, right. but it's still in the ginger family. So that sometimes that's what happens. Nice. Um, I believe the wild ginger referred to in Ontario, you, it grows in woodlands and shaded areas. It has sort of a heart shaped leaf about say size. Um, and I think the leaves can be used for, for flavoring cooking. Um, but uh, it's very different from the strap type leaf ginger that's from Europe and Asia. Interesting. I, I, I don't want to be quoted on this one, but I, I do remember doing some uh, research about ginger. And if I remember correctly, I think it was King Henry who believed uh, that uh, ginger uh, helped against the Black Plague. Um, pretty sure it was one of those kings that just felt that it was good for uh, warding off the plague. So uh, it's something maybe we can look up later and just make sure I have the right, <laughs> the right uh, uh, king related there. But that's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, mustard will be put into a paste to help with colds, like the, the classic old mustard paste on the chest. method. That's from some of the stuff I've seen in my co uh, cookbooks and my, my books that have been translated. That's been around for ages. Mustard packs, for sure. Has anybody seen a recipe for a mustard pack? I know there's one in, I'm pretty sure there's one in Good, uh, the Good Housewives, uh, one from uh, the 15, late 1500s. I know, uh, thinking about other things that we, we've eaten or used in cooking, um, going back to saffron, saffron was uh, used apparently as an aphrodisiac. I didn't know that. It was something new that I heard. Um, but it was also used for mental illnesses. I, I don't know much about it other than that's what it had written on one of the pages I was reading. I was like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Sage is another one uh, that was uh, um, the Latin word sal salver, I believe means to cure. Um, they believed it to be um, related to longevity and uh, immortality. Um, but it was also, a, a, you know, obviously used to, you know, as a great meat preserver in sausages and things like that. Um, but I think there was a lot of uh, medicinal uses for it, like cankers, and um, they used the fresh leaves for insect bites, um, symptoms of menopause, um, herpes infections. Um, in 1500s, I think they quoted something about it was good for the head and brain. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Sorrel is another one I've seen in soups. Does anybody know anything about sorrel being? Uh, that's kind of another one. Go ahead. Well, I mean, oh. uh, the so sorrel. There's like twelve different kinds of sorrel in period. Um, I think Markham talks about like. Dozens. I was trying to narrow down which sorrel it would be, um, and dozens. They're just just a bitter plant. I don't know about the medicinal properties. We, we have it growing in our garden, and we it's a spring. It's a thing. It's one of the first things that comes up in the spring, and it's a long. Um, oh, my camera's here. It's a long, sort of thin plant, and they were grown in Russia a lot. This particular kind of sorrel, and it was one of the first things that you could eat. So you know. Springtime is usually famine time because your food is almost gone. And yeah, you needed you needed <laughs> vitamins and uh, vitamin C wow. and anything that was growing, right? And it tastes great, and it's not the same. It looks completely different from wood sorrel, and so I almost wonder if if it's a general term to describe a certain kind of plant. I don't. I'm just speculating, but. Because they certainly don't look the same. Yeah, I've got uh, two types of garden edible sorrels in ours. We've got a French sorrel that clumps and never bolts. And then we've got the normal, what you think of as garden sorrel, which has the rosette of stalk, as Gus described, long, skinny. They're both astringent. Um, the only difference, uh, I think, is uh, cultivar between the two, because the uh, one that doesn't ever bolt 
um, it never sets seed, so it is propagated through division. Um, but it's convenient because throughout the year, you can pick leaves whenever you want for salads and soups. And this is where I say, and I have too much of it. So if you want someone, message me. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, you said French sorrel. French, uh, French sorrel, I think, is, was typically one of the ones that was used for soups. Um, yeah. Is that it the does. one that doesn't bolt or does? Uh, the one I got from Richter's is called Profusion Sorrel, and they say it's based off of French sorrel, but obviously it's a varietal. It doesn't bolt, it never sets seed, it's clump forming, and I started with, you know, the Richter's, you know, three leaves of a plant, and I have four clumps that are about so. Nice. Um, nice. And they, you know, leaves are about, they big, uh, and tender and delicious, and my kid, every time she's in the garden, she's four, and she says, Mommy, can I have the leaf? And she points at the sorrel plant and says, yes, you may have the leaf, because she loves eating them raw and bitter. Um, <laughs> That's good to know. I know for myself, uh, one of the only sorrels that I've really used in a dry form is a sheep sorrel. Um, it's actually used um, modernly um, in, I shouldn't say modernly, I guess it was probably uh, 1970s where uh, we had um, uh, something that come out, uh, people were using for um, helping with cancer. Uh, it's called um, Asiac. Uh, it's one of the ingredients in Asiac. So it was actually done through the Indians and it was a nurse who helped develop and, and research uh, what all was in that, including I think they used burdock root, but that's more of an um, Indian kind of a, a remedy. But uh, obviously it, it helps with um, increasing your immune system. So it's not necessarily, they say cancer fighting agency, I think they're talking about increasing your immune system so that you can fight off things uh, that are natural to you. Um, um, I think it was also used too for like the treatment of skin pro um, like problems and um, cleansing tonics. A lot of spring plants that come out, um, you know, uh, things that we don't even necessarily think of, but, um, you know, rhubarb and things like that have um, certain properties that they say are very helpful to the body at that time of the year after having a winter and not having certain vitamins in our system. There are certain spring plants that just are naturally good for us to have and they're ripe and ready at the right seasons, which I think is, um, um, you know, fascinating that nature provides sometimes things at the right times of the year. And I always wonder how that affects us now and being able to go in the supermarket and buy, you know, uh, you know, uh, rhubarb at, you know, September or October when maybe our bodies weren't necessarily needing it. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other um, thoughts about that. Well, scurvy is a real thing. <laughs> so if you've been eating salted, smoked, you know, dried root stock things and you're getting down to the bottom of the barrel, I suspect that uh, the spring tonics and those, the greens, while not protein, would certainly like put the baboon back in your, in your steps so you could do things. Like, that's very true. I, I, scurvy, that's a, a good one to, to mention because I know that um, there's a lot of different plants that have a real boost of vitamin C that sailors used to use. Uh, rose, rose water apparently was one that was used uh, that has high vitamin C. I didn't know that. I just recently read that. Um, and the other one that I think I read was nasturums. Um, so if you uh, glow, grow these plants, they have a, a beautiful uh, flower and it, when you eat it, it almost tastes like a radish. It's very uh, peppery tasting, um, but apparently it was uh, really high in uh, vitamin C and uh, was used for preventing scurvy and uh, like a, a natural antibiotic. Does anybody else think of anything else that's really high in vitamin C that was used? Uh, Just let everyone to, to interrupt, we've got about five minutes left so that we can get closed off this meeting and the next class can get started on time. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Certainly, I think a lot of the teas and tisanes that we look at as having a bunch of ingredients and we look at it and we go, I don't know whether this would promote health. Um, when you're looking at people cooped up all winter, uh, adding some extra raspberry leaves and that sort of thing to your teas, um, can really actually fortify your health and uh, people who do that regularly would have uh, survived and fared better um, without the access to fresh green vegetables.
I jump in with a couple of things. Sure. I don't know. Um, first is that um, a few years ago, I was getting a lot of headaches and I wanted to not be taking modern drugs all the time. So I just looked up and there was seven different kitchen herbs that were good for reducing headaches. So I just started going through my herb cabinet from the kitchen and making tea with each of them. Um, sage is one that I can remember. Um, the other thing is that I've got a little essential oil bottle that's called Thieves Blend. And one of the strongest scents or flavors that comes out of that is clove. And the story behind the Thieves Blend is some thieves were robbing from the houses of people with plague and they got a pardon if they were to give away the recipe for their formula. Nice. Yes, please, friend. Perfect. That's actually really interesting. <laughs> I can try and share it later. <laughs> Well, since we're coming down to the closing, did anybody want to add anything else? I mean, there's so many plants I'm sure that we haven't uh, even touched on. You know, uh, St. John's wort, uh, tansy was another one I heard uh, was used. Um, it was a strong smelling one that they used uh, in preserving uh, and putting in uh, before refrigerations. They used to use it in coffins and meats and storage and containers. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, when you research more about the plants, you find that, you know, uh, there's toxicities uh, with with a lot of them. So yarrow, uh, that's another one that's uh, a healing plant often, uh, you know, uh, has lots of legends and believing Achilles was given it to uh, him from the gods uh, to help with uh, healing his wounds of his soldiers. Um, yarrow's yeah, another one that uh, seems to be pretty common in a lot of um, gardens. Well, uh, we only have about two minutes left before we do get booted off. I just want to make sure that uh, I say thank you, everybody, to um, joining us today. And uh, I know I did a lot of the talking. <laughs> I had a lot of material that I wanted to share, but I'm, I'm really glad that you all were able to, uh, to make it out and talk a little bit about historical medical plants. Um, uh, Dorothea, you have uh, some medical uh, plant uh, questions. I think uh, later today I'm going to go into one of the um, the, the social kind of chat rooms. Uh, if anybody mm -hmm. wants to maybe meet me there, I'm going to go maybe around two. Uh, not necessarily teaching anything, just if there's any questions that we didn't get to uh, two o'clock today, I'll, I'll try to be in one of those common rooms and we can just have some um, discussions about anything if anybody's interested to yeah. talk a little bit more. Okay, sounds good. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Happy fall. Thank you. Bye.